My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. Other people want to make friends? I'm just trying to make you some money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate and teach. So call me at 1-800-743-CNBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. Every night I come out here and tell you what happened during the day, why it happened, and what you can do with the information. I do it in order to help you be a better do-it-yourself investor or a better client. I do it with a spectacular team of people headed by an executive producer, Regina Gilgan, who has been with me since inception. And with the help of dozens of fabulous people who are responsible for everything from all the look and feel of the show to the research, we have a team that helps me with memos that back up the research. And we have a head writer who's really our only writer, has been our only writer since inception when he was a freshman in high school. That's Cliff Mason, my sister, Nan, and her husband, Todd's son, my nephew. Now, the show after years and years has become a bit of a labor of love. We've been doing it for so darn long. We take it for granted what we do. And tonight, you know what? I'm going to change that and correct it. Tonight, I want to talk to you about the show, its evolution, and how you can best use it or worse, misuse it. And I'm doing so because there's so much we throw at you that you might not be able to use it as effectively as we would like. I know this because I talk to enough people about the show and interact with enough people through email and callers, as well as, of course, Twitter at Jim Kramer, that I have a pretty good idea why you come here and what you really want. Now, the show's evolved mightily from when we started. Show, by the way, was an outgrowth of a radio show. It was called Real Money. It's where we first heard Booyah, by the way, which I did in conjunction with a company I started called The Street. Still going strong, still write for it every day under the paid site, also known as Real Money, and I manage my charitable trust from those auspices. When we started the show, people were thirsting for specific investment ideas. I was happy to comply. But the stock market changed over time. We got hit with the Great Recession, which challenged what we call the entire asset class of stocks, meaning stocks as a way to save and make money. We had many companies, big companies, particularly in the financial world, destroyed by the downturn, mostly because they had lent a lot of money and didn't have enough money in the bank to handle the losses that came from a dramatic decline in economic activity. It was a credit crisis. I am proud of the fact that if you watch me, you might have avoided a lot of the downturn because I shouted from the rooftops that the Fed was nuts. They were nuts. And that the situation was far worse than anyone realized. No matter. I always find it a tad ironic that while even the Fed acknowledged in its minutes that I was the only guy saying that things were falling apart, I was also the only guy in the media who was vilified for not telling people to sell. That damned if you do, damned if you don't. But that year has changed. And it changed me. It changed the show. It was more of a metamorphosis, nothing radical, although not imperceptible, because I added some language at the very top of the show was meant to describe a new manifesto, a new reason for being. I now say every night in some form or another that the show is meant to educate, to entertain, to teach. And I say it different times in different ways each night. That's very important and very different from the original show, a total break in a lot of ways, because I think that it's just not enough to give you stock ideas. In fact, we've deliberately minimized them over the last, well, decade. We want for you to be able to understand the process and to pick them for yourself. Or more important, we want you to understand the stock market enough for you to make a judgment whether you can do it yourself. Now, me, I love individual stocks have for, for years and years and years. I think they can be tremendous vehicles that can lead to great wealth. Our show's identification with certain stocks, literally from the get-go, stocks like Apple, Ch uh, Chipotle, PepsiCo, Salesforce, Honeywell, Starbucks, and yes, Bristol Myers, hasn't gone unnoticed. But ever since we changed the show, we have tried to leave behind the so-called new ideas or the hot ideas, and instead tried to give you themes that allow you to invest in more fertile sectors versus others. Themes that I hope I can make come alive with analogies, sports, movies, whatever, so you can do the homework on them. Themes like the new frugality, post the Great Recession, or living longer through healthy eating habits, social, mobile, cloud, connectivity investments. I've written many books over time. Proud of that. I know the Confessions of a Street Addict by Autobiography, written four years ago before the show began, remains a favorite. But I've got to tell you, I think that Get Rich Carefully is designed to be this sh new show's companion. A lot of what I talk about in the show, if you're having trouble, Get Rich will do it. I'm cognizant that the market is hard. 
You've got time burdens. You've got demands. You may be bewildered despite my attempts to try to make things clear. That's why I've emphasized that I am not just okay with index funds, but I insist that you use them. I would not own a single stock until I put away at least $10,000 in an index fund, either through your IRA or your 401k. While I have addressed saving for retirement and saving for tuition and emergencies in many shows, I have not ever point blank warned you off individual stocks. So let me do this on a night. I would actually vastly prefer you to invest in index funds than be, say, in mutual funds. Mutual funds have not distinguished themselves enough to be able to take the percentages they do. Now, there are always individual cases where individual managers do acquit themselves. But managers uh, move on record, uh, and records can change, and past performance, of course, is no guarantee all that jazz. Which brings me to point number one of this show. I am not a shill or a snake oil salesman for individual stocks. I am a believer in the asset class of stocks as part of an overall way to save money for retirement, tuitions, vacations, anything your heart desires. I do want you to have what is known as exposure. That's a technical term to the stock market. And I try mightily to convince you that it is worth it to do so because stocks have indeed created so much wealth over time. If you don't believe me, why don't you read Warren Buffett's amazing golden anniversary report that describes why stocks are tremendous as an asset class to own. He makes a great brief for them. Why do they work? Because they represent the sum progress of business and the prospects for business going forward. They represent the wealth that companies create in aggregate and the sharing of that wealth with shareholders. You get to be along for the ride, and I want you to be along for that ride in a responsible way, which is most definitely owning an index fund. I'm partial to the S&P 500. But I also like a fund that gives you a total return or a fund that encompasses all the stocks in the market and offering that is often found among various fund houses. If you aren't offered one, then of course go to the S&P 500. Once again, for those who don't get it, here's my bottom line. The show has changed over time from one where we pick stocks for you to one where we educate you about stocks so you can understand why an index fund of stocks might be worth investing in. There's only one problem. We know you like stocks, too, or you wouldn't be watching or need to watch, which is why when we come back, we will explain to you why we bother to delve in individual stocks at all after we have progressed, professed, I mean, such undying love these days for index funds as the first way to go. Larry in Massachusetts. Larry. Jim, I know I've mentioned it before, but I just want to tell you how much your nightly focus lessons remind me of Roosevelt's fireside chat. <laughs> well, President Roosevelt was a great man. Uh, Larry, thank you. That's what sometimes my mom says, just say thank you. Thank you, Larry. We need you out here, Jim. Thank you. Here's the question for tonight. When does an investment turn into a trade? We don't chase a stock. We don't right. accumulate too many stocks to have to monitor. So how quickly? And at what percentage gain do we unload a small position, which has gotten out of control, high-quality problem? And conversely, how quickly and at what percentage loss do we admit, we admit that we got it wrong? Okay, I, I have shorthand for these. I like to take off now. My, new, you know, my rules have evolved. Uh, you, you, when you're up 50%, you take off 25%. And when you're up 100%, you take off yes, all of your initial investment. Then you play with the house's money and you say, thank you very much. And you got a good gain. Uh, investment into trade, well, we don't do that. If something's an investment, it's labeled an investment, it is an investment. If you didn't get enough in when a stock came down and then moved up, you can kick that out for a trade. An investment becomes a trade when you didn't get the whole position on. Greg in New York, Greg. Greg, I, Jim, I feel like we speak every day. How are you doing? I'm doing quite well, Greg. How about you? I'm doing well. I just got a quick question. Me and my friends are pretty young investors. We're in our young 20s. I just want to know. Do you think it's worth taking more risk when you're younger and you don't have as much when you don't have enough money uh, to kind of put more, uh, to, to, you know, put more money on the line and then try to seek the higher profit? Greg, listen to me. Take- listen to me, Greg. Yeah, you know, I didn't start with much money, um, but I took big risk because I have my whole life ahead of me. You've got your whole life ahead of you. Buy some stocks and they go down big. You got that paycheck coming. It's only older people who are further down the line who don't have enough paychecks left. You take that big risk. That's what I want. Chris in Oregon. Chris. Yes, Jim. Thank you for taking my question. And thank you very much for all the great advice you've given me. Every position in my portfolio is Captain Kramer approved and doing very nicely. <laughs> You're very kind, Chris. Thank you so much. How can I help? Uh, my question is, I have a IRA uh, equity portfolio that I don't plan to draw on for about five more years. And everything then is obviously reinvested into it. My question is about 
uh, dividends. Does it matter whether you reinvest those dividends back in the stock that generated them or just reinvest them in the fund in general? All right. I just I have anytime you can reinvest dividend, just reinvest dividend. It's a hard and fast rule. Just always reinvest those dividend. Power of compounding. One of the greatest single things that can happen to your money is the compounding of dividends. Okay, teach a man to fish. Sure, the show's evolved. But our mission remains the same, to make you the home gamer better investor, no matter what you invested. I'm in your corner. Plenty of mad money ahead, including how to plug into one of the market's biggest sources of wealth over the, the last few decades. Plus, it can be a huge way to win, but also a massive catastrophe if you're not careful. Don't miss this important advice, and I'm taking your tweets. Mad Money will be back after the break. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com. 